Here are three big objections I have to Catholicism. And some of them aren't even really objections. They're more uh, questions coming from a Protestant. So, at uh, Trent Horn in the comments, so he reacts to my video. Um, yeah, and I'm not even, I'm not trying to start wars out here. I'm just trying to start a conversation about some things that I don't think quite make sense over in Catholicism camp. Perpetual virginity of Mary. Wait, you want to be a perpetual what? So let's start by clearing some stuff up about Catholics and their view of Mary. So Mary is the mother of Jesus, and uh, they're, uh, they often refer to Mary as the Theotokos, which is a uh, translates to God-bearer, meaning that Mary bore God in her womb, which Protestants shouldn't have a problem with, but some of them do because they are silly. Uh, because we believe that Jesus was God and he was always God and he didn't become God later or become God at his baptism. He was God as a baby and he was a God the day he was crucified. So it's perfectly fine to say that Mary is the mother of God as long as we're clear that Mary does not predate Jesus and that Mary is not more powerful than Jesus. But yes, was the mother of Jesus, Jesus was God, so Mary was the mother of God. Is a fair thing to say for Protestants and Catholics. And it's also vital to Christian theology that Mary was a virgin at the time that uh, Jesus was conceived. Because if she wasn't, then that pokes a lot of holes in the, first of all, the reliability of the Gospel of Luke that says that Mary became pregnant with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. But if it was by the power of Joseph, then that uh, is not as good. So the virginity of Mary is very crucial up to the time of Jesus being born. However, Catholics and Orthodox uh, churches also believe that Mary was a virgin for the rest of her life following that. And some Protestants actually argue that it would be sinful of Mary to remain a virgin her whole life, given that she was uh, married to Joseph. Paul talks about in one of his letters that uh, in marriage, one's body belongs to your spouse, the woman's body belongs to her husband, and the man's body belongs to his wife. And so for Mary to deny Joseph that for their whole lives is kind of weird, right? The real problem I have with it is why on earth it matters and why this is such a huge point of theology for the Catholics. Why is this the hill that you're dying on? Who cares if after Mary bore Jesus that she had sex? You're not about to tell me that sex is evil when God's first commandment was to literally have a bunch of freaking babies. The Bible doesn't really seem to suggest that Mary was a perpetual virgin for the rest of her life. So where does the idea come from? Well, it's kind of handed down through tradition and taught by the church, even though it's not explicitly written in the Bible. The next uh, thing I have is very close to the first one, and it's having to do with Mary. It's this next doctrine that uh, Mary was sinless. So in addition to being a perpetual virgin her whole life, a big piece of Catholic theology is that Mary was also completely sinless. Uh, one argument I heard from a Catholic friend is that um, how can Jesus, something perfect, come from something imperfect? So to which that actually kind of starts a bit of an infinite regress. Uh, so you'd have to ask, okay, were Mary's parents perfect? And were their parents perfect? That argument doesn't make a whole lot of sense and you can just solve it by saying, well, it's a miracle. Life in general is a miracle. And the conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit is a miracle. And if Mary was a sinner, it doesn't really reduce our view of her of any way. Everyone else in the Bible is a sinner except God. So once again, it seems like a pretty inconsequential piece of doctrine that uh, is difficult to defend by Catholics given that there's not a whole lot of biblical support to it. And it feels like they've backed themselves into a corner having to say that tradition is one of their highest authorities and church teaching is one of their highest authorities, um, even when it comes to something that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of theological weight to it. But again, at Trent Horn, and maybe he can uh, correct me there. The next big objection is prayers to the saints. And uh, there's a lot of misconceptions right there with prayers to the saints. So a lot of Protestants think that uh, Catholics are doing like necromancy and like, oh, we pray to the dead people. Ooh. Well, what they would say is that prayers to the saints is like prayers with just your friends on earth, right? It's intercession. So you don't pray to the saints like they're God. You pray for them to intercess on your behalf. You say, you say up to like St. Peter or something. You're like, hey, St. Peter, can you intercess and talk to God about this thing for me? In the same way you'd get with your friends together at a Bible study and be like, hey, well, let's pray together for John. He's having a rough week, stuff like that. The problem, once again, is it's not a super biblical doctrine to be praying to saints. And Catholics have found like a few like hyper ambiguous verses to say like, oh yeah, that's that's where we get the idea for praying to the saints. 
it's the same thing with like the papacy they're just like find some really ambiguous verse that could be open to interpretation in a lot of ways and then develop it into a massive piece of doctrine like prayers to the saints which is not really something you'd want to be wrong about so one of the typical answers i hear from catholics when it comes to prayers to the saints um, is first of all you know it's just intercession it's not necromancy but then they also say well most of the church fathers if not all were hugely into prayers to the saints and the church fathers are the earliest christian teachers and pastors who aren't included in the bible so they have a ton of really valuable writing out there and a lot of them say that those early church fathers uh, were big in prayers to the saints and prayers to mary the trouble with saying oh church fathers did this thus it's true is assuming that everything the church fathers did was something that they should have been doing as if the traditions of the early church were perfect they were closest to the beginning but that doesn't make them right because when you actually look at the earliest churches look at the church in ephesus in rome in corinth these are churches that sucked so bad at being churches that paul is writing to them every 42 seconds about how much they suck Paul literally writes to the church in Corinth about how the people are going to communion there and they're literally going because they want to eat a ton of bread and get drunk on the church wine. That's how bad it was there. So to think that just because something was the early tradition of the early church and that the church fathers supported, it's good information and they have valuable things to learn from, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything they taught was true. The final objection I'll talk about in this video is the idea of tradition as a form of authority. So all types of Christians, Protestants, Orthodox, and Catholics alike believe our highest authority is God. But we also believe that God has given us a couple of things. We believe that he's inspired the Bible, we believe that he's established his church, and we believe that we have tradition that preserves the truth. And so across the three main denominations, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Orthodoxy, you're typically going to see those three things as the primary authorities. Tradition, church, and Bible. And in Catholicism, it's supposed to be a perfect balance of all three that works like a checks and balances system, not unlike our US government with the judicial, the legislative, and the executive branches that all kind of check and balance each other. So they have these three authorities that are supposed to be in perfect balance. My problem with tradition is being a form of authority at all is the same kind of problem I had with prayers to the saints. Just because something was a tradition doesn't mean that tradition is true. So a tradition can be anything. Christmas is a tradition. Great tradition. Going to church is a tradition. Not eating meat on Fridays is a tradition. All traditions which I think are rooted in some good truth. However, if I were to say to you that in my family it's tradition to be an atheist, now we would suddenly disagree with my use of tradition. See, a tradition can pass along something good or something bad. And when we trace a tradition back, we need to know where does this tradition come from? Does it come from a good true teaching or does it come from a false teaching? And so my perspective of classic Protestantism is we said, hey, we've got a lot of these traditions, but I'm going to check and balance them using the Bible, this original solid authority that is, and that matches with the original transcripts incredibly well. And traditions that matched up with the Bible, we're like, hey, let's keep those. Like the Lord's Supper being the real presence of Jesus. It's clearly taught in the Bible, and it's a tradition, and the church has taught it. So it's definitely something we should include. When it comes to prayers to the saints, it's ambiguous to non-existent at best. When it comes to the papacy, it's ambiguous at best. Drop a comment with your perspective in the comments, tag your favorite Catholic apologist, and have a blessed day!